So in this segment, I'm going to talk about the risk as uh, Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, specifically the first one. And I'm going to do it uh, as, as a way to uh, sort of bring out some of the principles that you would generally use or see uh, with Risk of Bias tools. So um, if you were really going to use the Cochrane Risk of Bias, and you would do this with any tool, you want to spend some time looking at the resources uh, uh, for that tool. And so, for instance, for the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, you could look at Chapter 8 in the Cochrane Handbook. And seriously, if you don't know what something like allocation concealment means, you can hardly assess it. Most Risk of Bias tools have supporting documentation. Whatever you use, read the documentation closely. Also, since you probably don't spend a ton of time thinking about things like risk of bias, especially if you're a clinician, you are likely to get hit with many terms that are unfamiliar. But lucky, luckily for us, the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine has some really great resources that are available. Say, for instance, you ran into a term that you might have heard but don't really understand. Well, here's a, you can check out the uh, Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine Dictionary. Um, let's say you need an explanation of different types of risk of bias in plain English. Here, you can check out the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine catalog of bias. And again, you might want to have these resources pulled up when you're first learning how to evaluate articles and the bodies of evidence. Now, domains and questions. For in, in the Cochrane Risk of Bias, there's one, two, three, four, five, six domains, right? Well, let's see what those mean. For selection bias, that really gets at, could the selection of participants bias the outcome? For performance bias, could the knowledge of group assignment bias the results? For detection bias, could the knowledge of group assignments affect the measurement and analysis? Then, for attrition, could loss of data bias the results? For reporting, did authors report only certain outcomes to support their main point? And then, of course, there's other bias, and this might deal include questions about the adequacy of the tools used to measure the outcome or the interventions, things like this. So these are just some very broad strokes. But before we move any further, let's just remind ourselves why on earth we would care about this. After all, you guys are interested in taking care of patients, not methods of evidence analysis. But notice on the previous slides that each type of bias can change the outcomes of a study. Each of these different types of bias may overestimate the effect. In other words, you can think of different sources of bias as sort of a magnifying glass that can blow up the true effect into something that appears much larger. So let's say we, there's a little, you know, a true effect, but it's really pretty modest or, you know, quite small. But bias in the articles can make it look like a really big effect, which is, which is wrong. So imagine a colleague or a patient mentions a study that reports findings that you find suspect. Or perhaps you think the findings are potentially exciting, you know, either way. But let's say that the study claimed that doing four setups a day um, will help you reduce your uh, LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, by 20 points. Well, if the study suffers from multiple sources of bias, the true effect could be something closer to 400 sit-ups a day could reduce your LDL cholesterol by 0.1 point. The whole idea is that they've really blown up the effects, and so now it's just basically no effect. The ideal is for random sequence generation is that there's really no way to anticipate the future assignments of subjects to group. You just, the researchers don't know, nobody could tell ahead of time who's going to get assigned to which group. The assignment could be anticipated for several reasons. For instance, the knowledge of a deterministic assignment rule, such as alternation. The first person that comes in is in one arm, the second person is in the next arm. The date of birth or the date of admission. Any of these is going to let people know uh, who, which arm the next person is supposed to be in. The knowledge of sequence of assignments, whether randomized or not, say if a sequence of random assignments is posted on a wall and you're, you know, going out into the, uh, the lobby to grab the next patient, well, you're going to know 
if they're going to be in, say, the treatment or control or comparison group. Also, it's a problem if you can predict assignments successfully based on previous assignments, which may sometimes be possible when randomization methods are used that attempt to ensure an exact ratio of allocations to different interventions. Say, we know that we need a male over the age of 65 who is black. Well, you know, there you go. It's going to be pretty easy to tell who the next uh, person is going to be. Which group will the next, be a per, uh, the next person be assigned to? Ideally, the researcher is clueless. In terms of allocation concealment, well, just because you randomize doesn't mean you're finished. A studies at risk of bias, if efforts made to generate unpredictable uh, and unbiased sequences are likely to be ineffective. So, for instance, a table of numbers uh, are, that are posted on a bulletin board. Again, you want the people to be the people who are assigning to groups to have absolutely no idea where the next person is going to go. Um, some people can decipher allocation schedules. Again, even if concealment is attempted, for instance, if the allocation envelopes are unsealed or they're translucent, they can be held up against a bright light to reveal the contents. Again, you really want no way for people to know. Basically, study staff could be just trying to be good people and assign you know, Miss Smith to the arm that they think is going to be most appropriate for, her, but you know, they could still bias it. So just because there's, you're, there's bias going on here doesn't mean they're evil people. It may mean they're good clinicians, but it's not good science. Then there's blinding of participants and personnel. If the authors tell you a study was blinded, that really doesn't tell you very much. Who was blinded? How? And, you know, was that blinding adequate? So if you look at these different types of approaches to blinding, you, it's better to think of it as a continuum rather than just a binary, did they do it or not. If people who determine outcome measurements are aware of the intervention assignments, bias could enter, be introduced into these. And outcome assessments that may be made by participants themselves, by their health, health care providers, or by independent uh, assessors. This is a serious problem, especially when the outcome is measured by a subjective scale. So if I'm your, you know, I treated you, and then I hand you a, a, a pain scale, and you knew, you know, you'd already finished one out ahead of time, and I'm sitting there with you, watching you uh, fill it out, or even potentially worse, helping you figure out, well, you're going to make me tip, or the person's going to typically want to make me look like my, I'm a good clinician and so I've reduced their pain. You see where that bias comes in. Then there's the incomplete outcome data. Missing outcome data due to attrition or dropout during the study or exclusions from the analysis raise the possibility that observed effect estimates could be biased. There's incomplete outcome data and that refers to both attrition and exclusion and when an individual patient outcome is not available we call it missing. And can, what you really want to be able to answer is, can you account for all of the subjects and all of the measurements on those subjects? And if there are any exclusions, is a rationale provided? Do the authors impute values for missing data? That's really important because there are wrong ways to handle missing data. Analysis of only subjects with completed data is known to bias the outcomes. Also, using last value carried forward to impute also has been demonstrated to have a lot of problems and to bias the results. Now let's talk about selective reporting. Selective outcome reporting is where the author selects a subset of the original variables recorded on the basis of the result. And what this means is, I'm only going to tell you the, te the results of the test where it worked out like I think it should have worked out. I'm not going to tell you where, you know, there were no statistical differences, etc. The particular concern is that statistically non-significant results might be selectively withheld from publication. Now, it's tough to get at this unless there's a protocol which can be cross-referenced. Often the only evidence that you have is that the hypotheses and the data that they tell you are collected map to the outcomes and discussion. You can find protocols if the author registered one, and not all do, at clinicaltrials.gov. Search up the study, and if you find it, compare what the author said that they do in the study against what they actually report in the article. 
If the article is missing analyses or if the article adds analyses that weren't initially planned, then you have evidence of selective reporting. Now, there are many other forms of bias, and again, you can look in the Cochrane Handbook, or if you're using a different tool, again, read the documentation. Well, now, we've, let's say we've assessed all our articles. How do we report this? Well, obviously, listing for your readers each criterion for each article uh, is just going to be dreadfully boring. You don't want to do that. So let's look at a couple of options that are a bit sexier. First, we could um, report risk of bias from multiple studies, and we use tables to do this. There are two common designs used to present readers with the results of your risk of bias analysis. Now, these tables were generated via RevMan, the free Cochrane Collaborative Systematic Review Platform. But you can create the tables by hand, so look at, let's look at them a bit more closely. This is the author by domain table. One way to set up this table is to have the author references on one axis and the domains on the other. Of course, you may prefer authors in the rows and domains in the columns, and it's useful if you have a lot of studies. Then, you can just use a symbol for high risk, red, uncertain, yellow, and low, green. You can easily set this up in Excel. Then we have a domain risk figure. And this is useful for you know, when you have a whole lot of studies and you want to focus on the risk for each domain and worry less about the risk in each specific article, then you can consider a, a risk a domain risk figure. And what this do, let's say you had 10 articles with, uh, within the blinding domain. So five articles were high risk, so 50%, two articles with, uh, were uncertain risk, so 20%, etc. And then that, what that's going to do is that's going to appear on that domain. Now, you can set this in Excel, uh, set this up in Excel, but you're going to have to do a few more calculations. So this one is going to take a little more work. Once you have the tables, then you need to tell the story. Look for patterns. Are there some articles that are more problematic than others? Uh, what does this tell you about trusting your findings? Are there ways of finding very, are their findings very different than others? And if this was the case, you probably don't want to put much trust in their results. Also, are there some domains that are more problematic than others? What does this tell you about potential results for the findings uh, if regarding your confidence in the synthesis? So this was a very broad brush look at the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. For greater detail, remember, read through the Cochrane Handbook, or if you're using a different tool, whatever that documentation is. If your study also includes designs of other than clinical trials, you probably want to spend some time learning the components of those tools relevant for the designs.